Welcome back to the Coronavirus in Kansas Small Business Survival Video Series. I am Matt DeSarl. I hope everyone out there is doing as well as you possibly can given the COVID pandemic. Uh, tonight's guest is the director of the KU Small Business Development Center, Will Katz. He actually rejoins uh, the YouTube playlist here. If you weren't familiar with an SBA office like the one Mr. Katz directs and you're a small business, well, you're probably aware of them by now. Will, how are you? Doing great, Matt. Thank you so much for having me back on. It, yeah. We're kind of facing a bit of a new normal, but we're, you know, my family and I are getting adjusted to it. So thanks for asking. Great, great. Well, it's great to have you back. And I can't believe it's been uh, the three weeks or so since we did this last. It seems, seems like an, an eternity ago. Yes. Boy, things have changed quite a bit since then, haven't they? Yes, sir. So people, businesses are applying or have applied at this point, but I did want to set the table with just a foundational question. What is EIDL and what is PPP? So that maybe you can kind of set the table for folks with the alphabet soup there. Yes, it is quite an alphabet soup. So EIDL, which I will call the idle loan, is um, it stands for uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And so that is a loan that comes directly from the SBA. When people apply for the idle, they apply to the SBA for the SBA to give them that money. Um, this program is at least 20 years old. Uh, I remember being a responder in Greensburg, Kansas, and I think that tornado hit in 2006. And my role there was providing quote unquote technical assistance for the idle application. So the program is, uh, um, it's a longstanding program. The thing is, it's usually applied um, where there's a tornado or a flood or maybe a hurricane. And so a uh, pretty small geographic area, defined geographic area. And the SBA is now trying to apply that to the United States of America. So pretty, pretty difficult for them to scale up, um, but that's what they're working on doing. Um, the PPP loan uh, is the Payroll Protection Program, and this is part of the CARES Act. So this is brand new, uh, new stimulus bill that passed, I think, a week ago Friday, 10 days ago. Um, and so this is a loan that's getting an awful lot of airplay uh, because of one key word, and that word is forgiveness, i.e. loan forgiveness, i.e. looks and smells like free money. And so people are very interested in that. Um, the PPP loan is, is an SBA loan, but in the more traditional sense, which means that you talk to a bank about that loan. You borrow the money from the bank. The bank is your interface with the SBA. Generally speaking, with most SBA loans, other than the idle, uh, with most SBA loans, you're dealing with a bank. The bank is saying, man, I would love to loan Matt some money, but SBA, here's the thing. If he doesn't pay me back, you're going to cover a big chunk of what he doesn't pay, right? So it's a loan guarantee. Most people are familiar with this notion from uh, college uh, student loans, Stafford loans, where they borrow from a bank, but then the federal government is the guarantor on that loan. And so that's the way the uh, payroll protection program works. You would talk to the bank about it. Um, it's an interesting concept. It's an interesting notion. And so what, what has happened is a bit of a backlog because I think there was a rush to get this loan up and running. Um, and I, I think that the banks would probably tell you that they felt like they didn't have the full guidance on what the underwriting requirements are, right? So if you're a bank, you're loaning money for two years at 1%. And you're a little bit nervous about it. You don't have a big spread on it. It's not super profitable. You kind of want to make sure that you've checked box 47 and box 32 correctly, because if you do anything that jeopardizes the guarantee, that's a pretty risky proposition since it's not a very profitable loan anyway. So my guess, my understanding from whom I've talked to is that banks are looking especially hard at doing this for existing clients, probably not in a mode where they're reaching out broadly to try to bring in new clients to do PPP loans for them. Um, so two very different things, PPP, two years, 1%, hopefully an element of forgiveness, especially as it relates to the payroll 
that you are paying people in this period. Idle is a 30 year super long term loan. Um, the idle does also come with uh, a ten thousand dollar emergency distribution, um, which will come when your loan is processed before it's underwritten. Um, but really very different programs. And I'm glad that you brought it up. I think a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, people didn't have any notion of the difference between those two programs. It is very important that they do. So thanks for giving me a chance there. So I know that the Treasury Department has basically promised to add liquidity to the market and help small businesses as needed. Are, are the funds basically coming from the same bucket when, you, when they talk about you know doing a new round, if they will, or they've even phrased it as a new inning of fund, funding? Is that coming from the same bucket so that if they basically uh, you know, double down on that support, is that applying to both, both those channels, the EIDL and PPP? You know, we'll have to see. My guess is that they would have to approach those separately. And I think that the idle, I was told, had $18 billion allocated to this incident. And you know what? That's actually not very much money. Um, I think that they would refund the idle separately from the PPP. And so I think the PPP had $349 billion allocated to this incident. It's a little different, though, because the initial capital will come from the banks, and then the SBA will basically have to pay the banks as a guarantor uh, for the forgiveness portion. And again, that's where all the, the, uh, a lot of the finer print is being read on the margins of the forgiveness portion of the PPP. You gave a video, pre video chat presentation with Explore Lawrence about two weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to assume that many viewers watching this today also watched that then. Uh, what, what updates have changed since then that you need to get the word out about? Or have you basically just kind of answered that in, in terms of laying out those differences? So there have definitely been some changes. Um, as I recall, at that point in time, the uh, idle loan was undergoing kind of a new portal reconstruction. So they ended up doing that two or maybe three times. So I have a, a super duper pro tip for you, for your viewers for tonight. Uh, and this comes from somebody that I work with that asked me a question that I couldn't answer. And I had them reach out to the SBA's customer service number. So if you have applied for an idle, look at your confirmation number. If your confirmation number begins with a three, you are in good shape. There's nothing more that you need to do or even that you can do other than wait for the SBA to reach out to you. If your confirmation number does not begin with a three, I would absolutely call the SBA's customer service line, and that is 800-659-2955. If your confirmation number does not start with a three, you want to call them and make sure that you get squared away. So... When you say squared away, what are, you, what are you checking on? Are you checking that you applied for the correct loan or are you checking uh, that, you're, that you're, the form that you filled out is still relevant or something, something else? Probably uh, the latter. But if it doesn't begin with, if it begins with a three, what I'm told is you're, what you're waiting for now is for an underwriter to contact you after they've processed your application. Again, keep in mind, they're used to doing this in let's say Douglas and Franklin counties because of flooding. They're now doing it in not just 105 counties in Kansas, but 77 counties in Oklahoma, I think is how many there are and who knows how many across the country. So they're really, really backed up. And they've, I think, tried to apply some kind of FinTech principles and some scale up principles. But it, it, last I heard, it would be three to five weeks for applications to be processed. And that was probably a week ago but I can't imagine it's not still two to four weeks before you even hear about that. So that's one thing that's changed. New portal face from the last time I did a presentation. Uh, the other thing is there has been a little bit of bouncing on the interest rate for the PPP. So I think that at one point in time, they had pitched it as prime plus six and a half percent, pretty, pretty substantial interest rate. For quite some time, it was at 0.5%. I think that the banks may have won a little bit of an argument here to get to charge 1% on 
still super low interest rate, one percent over two years. Um, but there's but that's been a little bit of a change. I think the program term has shortened to two years, and the interest rate is now one percent on it. So there are a lot of changes all the time, and and I think that that's because we've never been through anything even really remotely like this before. This is just new territory. So I think everybody's adjusting from the SBA to treasury, to the banks, to whatever. But I think to answer your question, those buckets of money look different. I mean, they have to be authorized by Congress. Um, so covering payroll is a critical component of this effort. What ground rules should employers keep in mind? My, my biggest piece of advice to all of the employers is to talk to your bank. I, again, I mentioned, I don't think too many banks are doing this for non-clients. One of the downsides, I think, to the way it was rolled out is sort of an unequal, um, like an unequal startup uh, ability to access that startup. So you might have seen this certainly last Friday, kind of the initial day of the PPP applications. And so there were, you know, if you looked on like tax Twitter, for example, was a Twitter about the fact that some banks were taking applications and some banks weren't. It's my understanding that taking applications and processing them with the SBA is a totally different story. I'd be surprised if any, if very many, if any of those loans have been actually funded right now as we sit here on Monday evening. Um, but I think it is important to know that your loan is from the bank. And so it's the bank's guidance that really matters. If you want to argue with your banker about the way that you're calculating the payroll contribution, um, okay, do it. But different banks interpret this different ways. In the same way, I think that different banks can come up online with applications at different times. You could imagine reasonable people coming to slightly different conclusions about that calculation. Um, if you read the interim final guidance, um, I think that they've left open the possibility that things might change, and they might. So um, my biggest advice point is listen to what your banker is saying and follow those follow those rules. So the other thing I wanted to mention about the PPP, in addition to you have to work with your bank, I think there's at least some possibility here that the forgiveness rules could be as flexible as some of the other things that we've seen in, in the PPP rollout. And so, for example, if you look at the higher fund that we rolled out in Kansas, it was supposed to be $20,000 that went to 250 businesses. It turned out that the demand was a lot bigger, but we had $5 million to allocate. And so I think they allocated $15,000 to 330 businesses instead. I think you have to be at least a little bit mindful uh, in terms of the PPP, that if they run through all that money, it's possible that there could be another allocation at the congressional level. It's also possible that they could say, take your PPP forgiveness calculation, multiply that by 70%, and that's what we're really going to forgive. So I think biz businesses should at least be cognizant of that. So is there a pathway for a small business to lay off employees, still get a disaster loan, and then hopefully rehire those same employees within, let's say, six to eight weeks? Yes. And in fact, I think that this race is a really interesting point. And I want to be a little bit careful here because I am not all knowing and all powerful. And it could be that the way that I would kind of strategically approach this isn't the best way. And it's, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to watch this and then say, oh, yeah, that's what I'm going to do and then be mad at me later because I can't guarantee you this is the best way. But the clearest path is the idle because it's an existing program. So I could imagine a situation where you apply for the idle and you take it. Um, and then you say uh, you're going to be closed for another four weeks and then you open and you start hiring employees back. And you can imagine you start hiring back and you're running a restaurant and it's four weeks from now. And you don't come right back at 100% revenues, right? You, maybe you come back at 40 to 60% of your revenues for a week or two weeks. And so I think you could talk to almost any restaurateur. Um, you could talk to me, a, a former factory guy, a manufacturing guy. And I would tell you, Matt, you cannot be as efficient at 40% of capacity as you can be at 90% of capacity. 
the, the space is still the same. You just have more steps to take. You have less density of everything in your kitchen, in your dining room, everything. So I think that when businesses start hiring back, um, that is a great application for the PPP loan and the forgiveness that goes along with it. In that sense, I think what you're really doing is you're hiring, you're hiring and then you're using the forgiveness to defray uh, a labor cost that's necessarily inefficient. If I'm a business owner, I think that's a pretty good trade-off. It's a pretty good deal. I may reduce the total amount of forgiveness that I'm eligible for, but I'm also reducing the risk quite a bit. So I would consider anyway using that PPP not to just keep my entire staff off of unemployment because unemployment's been beefed up, right? And so unemployment's going to apply to more people and the benefit's going to be bigger. I'm not sure if I'm helping people if I pull them off of unemployment, hoping that I get forgiveness from the PPP. What I think I might do is hire the people back as I need them, even if it's inefficient, even if I'm over hiring in a sense, but then use the PPP to defray the cost of that over hiring back, if that makes sense. You, you may have just answered this question and uh, I'll, I'll credit Taylor LaRue with your office for, for giving me the tip to ask this, but can, <laughs> okay. can, a small, can a small business apply for both the EIDL or what you've been applying, referring to as the EIDL and the PPP? Yeah, so there had been some early guidance that said that maybe that was not going to be the case. But yes, absolutely, completely different programs. There are some minor points of overlap. Uh, for example, if you take the I'm sorry, so you can, I'm I'm sorry, so you can apply for both. You can apply for both, definitely, with with a couple of things to watch out for. So, for example, with the idle loan, if you take the initial emergency ten thousand dollar distribution, that will count against any forgiven amount in the PPP, um, which makes sense because it, otherwise it would be double dipping. You take 10,000 from here, have another 10,000 forgiven here, all to pay $10,000 worth of wages. So yes, the, uh, the, the PPP emergency, or the idle emergency distribution will offset PPP forgiveness, but you can definitely apply to both. And in fact, my advice to most businesses would be to apply for both, quite frankly. Okay, well, I was hoping to draw up a hypothetical here that hopefully could have a lot of different applications for small businesses. Let's say that you have a construction company with 10 employees on payroll, but you also have five contractors who you work regularly with. Let's say one of those contractors earns $25,000 in average with your company per year. Does that small business that you're running apply for a dollar figure that would cover that contract worker's pay? Or does that independent contractor go out on his or herself and get the disaster relief? That is a great question. And so my understanding is that um, that contractor could go out on their own to apply for disaster relief. And that's probably gonna be the best way to do it. With the uh, PPP program, um, my understanding is that the banks are not calculating contractor wages into the payroll forgiveness piece of this. So each one of those contractors would then have to go file their own application. Really good question. Um, you know, another thing that I wanted to mention really quick on the notion of overlapping programs is there's uh, another part of the CARES Act called the Advanced Employer Tax Credit. So um, I think it's worth talking to your bank and also possibly your tax preparer because I think for some businesses, they might find that the tax credit is even more beneficial to them in the long run financially than the PPP, especially if they're banking on a certain level of PPP forgiveness that I don't know if, they have, if, they, if that's necessarily gonna happen. I think that a lot of people think about the PPP as you apply and there's this guaranteed amount that's gonna be forgiven right up front. I don't think it works that way. My understanding is that all of the forgiveness calculations get pushed back because we don't know how many people you will hire back or how many hours they will work between now and June 30th. So I don't think it's quite as crystal clear as all that. Um, so it is worth talking about the uh, advance employer tax credit to whoever your tax provider uh, might be, tax preparer. 
Uh, I applied for a disaster loan today for my sole proprietor LLC. You could say I was doing a little a little prep for our interview as well in the process. So uh, there were a few check boxes dedicated to keeping Americans at work. Obviously, it had a very patriotic feel about some of those check boxes. Sure. Do you think that that effort does enough to protect jobs from going overseas? And what sorts of power does the government have to police those requirements in the in the future? Wow, that's an interesting question. You know, when I think about jobs going overseas, I think about larger, probably, market forces at work than even what we're seeing here now. So, um, and I think I also probably think about businesses that are larger than the ones that I deal with on a, on a regular basis. You know, thank you for your leadership at this time, and thank you for being a mentor who people can rely on and, and someone in the community who, you know, is fielding all of these questions. It's such a confusing time. And, um, you know, I, I, um, you know, in, in a similar way where I look at, at doctors and nurses with appreciation and gratitude at this time for what they're doing, you know, I look like, I look to your office and, and everyone who's working there and answering questions and being available 24 seven, uh, with a lot of gratitude as a small business owner, somebody who I really I just give a heartfelt thank you to. Man, I tell you what, that is way too kind. You know, um, and, and it is clearly not just me. My colleagues, Christina and Taylor, have been on the phone and on email 24-7 for weeks, and they're doing a great job. I mean, they have learned a lot of the programs and synthesized a lot of the information. And, you know, again, the, the, the Kauffman Center and lots of other entrepreneurial think tanks have done study after study that clearly demonstrate that the real critical success factor for any small business is this. Do you have somebody that you can talk to? So for some people, it's a parent or it's a sibling or it's a professional mentor who's helped them throughout their career and helped them start a business. You know, a lot of people don't have even really that. Um, and so they have to look for that person to talk to where they can find it. So I'm proud that our office serves that role. Uh, Christina and Taylor have both been incredible at learning that trusted advisor role and also learning the content that has to go behind it. I'm uh, proud of both of them uh, and really appreciative of the work that they've put in. That said, I, I don't think that puts us anywhere where near doctor or nurse or firefighter range. I mean, those people are taking a lot more risk of life and limb than we are. Um, you know, so am I proud? Yes. I wouldn't say, I, I mean, clearly I'm, I would much rather have never found out, you know, what we are capable of. Um, I would much rather that this never happened. Um, but I just feel like we are doing the best job that we can to fulfill the role that we have right now. And, and I think, by and large, across most of society, that's what I see. People are doing everything they can to, to fulfill the thing that they can do. Absolutely. You make a great point, and, and it's a good time to thank everyone at LMH, every every local public health official and government official who uh, nurses and doctors and uh, nurses' aides and everyone on the front lines battling this thing and everyone who is in that fight firsthand. Um our, our thoughts and prayers go out to you and, oh, yeah. and um, that's absolutely, absolutely the priority. And, and uh, that goes without saying, but it's worth, it's worth mentioning. Uh, I should be mentioning that in every, in every video we do here, of course, will anything that you wanted to mention that I didn't guide with questions. Um, so I, I, I want to just really quick because you sort of alluded to this and, and I'm going to give my colleague, Christina, credit for kind of passing this information along to me. And it comes from NDC, National Development Council. But they um, have given some guidance for us to look at this recovery, this situation in three stages. So you've got like rescue stage. And this is where we've been for the last three weeks. I and mean, these businesses need something now. They need a lot of stuff. Like we need to make sure that they can survive. And then next comes this stabilization. And I hope that we're entering stabilization here in the next week or two. And in stabilization, 
towards the end of that, you start to see businesses reopen and apply the PPP and pay for payroll and all that stuff. And then after stabilization comes recovery. And so that's where, my opinion, we need to get as many business owners as we can with us all the way across this thing to the recovery stage. Um, we need them because the, like, these are the people that are battle tested. And for us to really fully recover as a country and as an economy, for us to recover as a community, and keep in mind, communities are defined by the choices they make. And a lot of those choices that they make are expressed by the types of small businesses that we support in our communities. To get all the way through to recovery, we need these people who are battle-tested business owners, who know how to manage inventory, who have the ability to access capital, who have the ability to manage the people around them, who have the ability to address markets. That is critical for recovery. We need every single one of the small business owners we can get with us on the other side. So I think that's, um, I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Thank you, Will. Will Katz, the director of the KU Small Business Development Center. Will, thank you so much for your time. And uh, good luck to you and yours, and, and we'll see you and speak to you hopefully soon. Thank you so much, Matt. You're doing great work. Keep producing. Have a good night, sir. Thank you, sir. All Keep right. producing. Thank you so much for Will Katz for joining us tonight. And if you're a small business owner and you would like to contribute to this video series, please email me directly at mattydmedia at gmail.com. Good luck to everyone out there running a business, and we will see you on the other side of this.